welcome to your favorite YouTube channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jimmy, shoot interview guest today, underneath the hot lights, is the great Kelly Jones. Uncle Kelly Jones, I like to call him, man. <laughs> uh, Uncle Kel. Yeah. <laughs> give us, Uncle Kel. Give us some of that bibliography so that we could jump right into the conversation, Jimmy. Dead Man, Sandman, Batman, Alien Hives, uh, Batman Dark Joker, Hammer, 13th Sun, Conan, Swamp Thing, Lobo versus Roadrunner. We could spend this entire <laughs> interview reading this list. Like, what a career Kelly has had. Um, very excited to get into some details here. Uh, the one title that uh, was left off uh, of this this uh, fantastic list, Uncle Kill, was a uh, Terraformers Wonder Color Terraformers. Comics. <laughs> yep. When where where does that lie uh, in your career before or after Micronauts? Uh, it was it was during that part, and um, sec I live in Sacramento, and there was a real strong comic book creative culture here. Uh, Ron Lim, Sam Keith, Tim Vigil. There was a lot of us here. And we were out in, you know, Tatooine as far as it was. We're <laughs> way away from the centers of comics and anything happening. And we had some friends who uh, were putting together some books. And they had found uh, through, I think, uh, Roger McKenzie and some other guys had put this little publishing thing together. So on the side, I would do my Marvel stuff. And on the side, I would work with these guys because they were just old friends, you know. Uh, there were buddies that I had, uh, you know, the comic shop guys, the your comic book friends when it was, you know, not cool. And you guys, we would just all get together and uh, we went to this pizza joint all the time. And, and I was, I had gotten in around 82. So I, I was already doing it. And much to my surprise, because I really didn't know what the hell I was doing when they hired me. It was just, you know, as an inker. And Marvel had transformed me into a penciler because they weren't liking the pencil samples after Butch Geist left Micronauts. And I thought I was done. You know, I was that naive. I did well, no, off to go to college again, you know, or whatever. And uh, the editor said, you want to do it. So I started doing it. But I still maintained this friendship with all, you know, I, even though you're working all the time, those are the people I like to hang out with. And so when they brought this forward, I said, hey, count me in you know i'll do it and i got to meet roger mckenzie out of it who i was a big fan of his his writing um and i always kind of i always kind of liked it afterwards you know i forgot all about it until you know you go to a show and someone brings it up to you uh it's always that um uh, they probably think they're going to embarrass you but I, it brought back great memories here's a, here's a question uh they, that sort of you make spring to mind being sacramento dude mm -hmm. uh are your deadlines for a uh, new york based marvel comics are your deadlines stricter because of fedex and things like how yeah, does that part I, it work? was i used to um where i really felt it was when they they by simple chance they put me on the covers for batman and detective and that was a very hectic period because they were trying to arrange all these books to be together. And a lot of times they didn't know what was, they couldn't, they know they needed it for solicitation, but they hadn't cleared what they were going to do. So I, I honestly, I would be called Monday morning for something that they needed sometimes the next day, sometimes Wednesday, because they were trying, they tried not to cut me that short. So I was just making it up as I went. And fear is a great great thing to make you just cut all the crap and get right to the core of it all i used to do is say composition first i have to come up with a cool composition next get to the point of whatever it is um and where it probably worked out is i was i was such a horror guy that i could pinpoint a dramatic or frightening shot which works well for a cover you know I, I used to tell them, don't give me those guys posing shot. I don't want to do posing or a group of guys or they're all coming at you. I don't want that. Um, when they were able to tell me what was going on, uh, I said, I, you know, I don't want to know too much. Just give me a, uh, tell me something quick because there wasn't time. Thank God. I, I used to refuse to get a fax machine. I wanted no one to see what I was doing. I wanted no one to know where I was at. Um, I didn't want anyone to know my speed. Um, because sometimes, uh, 
you just want to you just want to work free of all the any imperial entanglements you know so um and they were benefiting from it at that time now for me i i was just uh, i was unaware of any of the effects of that but it, how well that was going but man i thank god every day i was in that deadline hell from being in california to new york i i looked at it as like okay today i got to come up with something and it, yeah it was frightening you know but then once you're about 10 minutes at the board and the idea comes it, it's fine and then i would look and i go you know three o'clock that was the cutoff i had to package it and get it to them they didn't come pick it up so i had to drive into town and um so I knew if I started at eight, it had to be done at 10. It forced me to buy a big copier so I could make uh, uh, big, nice copies in case it got lost. Um, uh, so I have a huge uh, history of my work in pencils and shit. I just made them and put them in a box and forgot about it. But I thank God every day for debt. I put personal deadlines on myself. You know, whatever it's going to be, it's got to be that day. Uh, any... A, a page that takes longer than a day is not going to do me any good. I don't. I don't think as well if I'm spending too much time on. It. Man, I feel like we could unpack that answer for the rest of this talk. <laughs> Where to begin? Um, you you know you mentioned doing a page in a day. I think your page layouts and storytelling are really strong and impressive. You're such a stylist. That's the first thing I assume everybody sees when they look at your work. But reading your work. I'm impressed by the actual storytelling is like very solid. And I think of you as, you know, 90s, maybe late 80s, a time whenever solid storytelling wasn't necessarily right. celebrated. I, I was very aware of what was going on around me. I was not aware of what I was doing that way. I didn't think of myself as being different. I thought of myself as I didn't want to compete with the time I was in. It wasn't like I'm dismissive. I just didn't get it. So I wanted to compete. Like, what if I was trying to get a job in 68 to 72 or in that period those guys because i looked at what they were doing and they were wonderful so i knew that people perceived me and probably rightly so it's kind of an artsy fartsy transgressive dude but i was very uh, i was a very blue collar transgressive artsy fartsy dude i wanted production i knew i only would get better if i had to do it and i had to you know with a gun to my head or otherwise um that's the only way you get better so I didn't really look at too much, but when I did, it was all very homogenous to me. And it was all very, uh, the storytelling was more about what the artist didn't want to draw. Right. And to me, it was, I used to tell Doug or anyone I worked with, if you for one sec second write to my strengths, I'm going to go nuts. Just write a story. I'll figure it out. That's the only way you get any good is if somebody gives you something you don't want to do, make it cool. I'm Man, so glad. Great. Yeah, I'm so glad you said those exact words because one of the things that I talk about on the channel often, I, I, I describe certain artists as drawing what I call pathologically cool, and what I mean by that is sort of what you're describing. Like, mm -hmm. if it's this chair I'm sitting on, there are artists who can figure out a way to create some curves and something to make it extremely interesting to look at, yeah. and I think of you very, very highly uh, on that list of people who could just. You could you could take anything and you figure out a way to distort it or add your spin to uh, whatever it is, whatever background details. Whatever. Well, I didn't learn. I didn't learn to draw by taking art courses and I didn't learn to draw by reading comics. I loved comics. So I consider myself an outsider fan to this day. I do not know how and where I, I mean, I did what I did and stuff happened. But you'd have to ask the people who hired me because I have no damn idea what how why they did. But where I learned was I took a lot of film courses. I was a huge film nut. So Cartoonist Kayfabe is brought to you by the books that we make. Uh, out now, Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus. Thank you guys so much for supporting it. And if you did not, we still have some copies available. Uh, there are two rounds of Red Room that are out there. Anti-Social Network and Trigger Warnings. Crypto Killers, the third in the set, is coming out in 2024 in January. And uh, X-Men Grand Design Trilogy trade paperback is coming to you in November. Another thing that's coming to you in November is the Street Angel Princess of Poverty collection that uh, is the companion piece to Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive. Jimmy's been at self-publishing over the course of uh, this past year, the BW Zine, 1986 Zine, and True Crime Funnies. 
And of course, Hulk Grand Design is out there on the stands, but uh, not for long. Now that we are done paying the bills, back to the video. Film doesn't really, people think it totally translates to comics. It sort of does, but it really doesn't. It, 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 but I loved it because it gave me, uh, I wanted an ambiguousness in my stuff. I don't want everything. I want the storytelling there, but then I want those images where you go pause for a moment or it's a different angle. I used to, I was delighted by stuff that other artists at the time weren't. They would love a big guy jumping at you or a guy yelling at you. Mine was somebody's got to plug, you know, I, I had the scene in a Batman where this guy was going to electrocute another dude and he had to plug in the thing to electrocute him. And I went, well, how do I do that with tension? How do I do that to make people slow down? And so I, I sat there and it just, it's why production's great where you're under it. And all of a sudden it hit me. The shot is from inside uh, the electrical plug-in, right? So you're just looking through these two slots and it stopped you. Well, what is that? But you see the guy coming with the prongs so you know that's what it is. That's not a superhero trope. That's a horror film trope, you know? And that's not a big, that was the thing I was most happy with. Where it's cool is I heard from so many other artists after that came out, wow, that, that stopped them. And then they realized and it all worked. But they were looking at it, you know? Now, to me, that was one panel in a oversized issue of Batman. But it made my day. <laughs> you know, it's just like every once in a while, you just want to work it. You just want to say, come up with something. I never thought of myself as transgressive. I just started hearing that from years later from other artists who would look at the stuff or say, well, if he can do it, I can do it. Or if he's going off and doing that. And I never thought of myself that way. I always thought of myself as just goddamn lucky that they weren't every month. I thought they're going to fire me over this, but I couldn't stop doing it. And I grew up knowing Sam Keith and he was doing what he was doing and I was doing what I were doing. We used to sit in my kitchen and draw and we would just go, can you believe they have not, people are, these editors are going for it. And I, and Sam once said, well, cause it's selling. <laughs> they, right. they, they don't understand it, but it, for whatever reason it's selling. He says, so I'm grateful. And I went, I guess that's true. So you're close to Sam. Um, he goes off to Image and, and really, you know, spends a big chunk of his time there doing Max. Did you have any uh, interest in doing that, like doing a creator-owned book, going in that direction? Well, I never thought I would get to be in comics. I didn't think I'd get to be at either of the big two. And Batman was the New York Yankees of comic books to me. So for whatever happened, I got the plumest plum in the whole thing. And I knew that Every artist, if you want to be remembered, your headstone is your work. It's not, you know, that's that's what it is. It ain't some tombstone somewhere. And I thought, you know, 100 years from now, they'll still, Batman will be, it's like baseball. I mean, they still care about games 100 years ago. I figured I'll stick with that. I had the good fortune of having people who I really admired, who had done it, come up and say, you're doing a really good, Neil Adams knocked me out, saying, if I'm the 70s, you're the 90s. And he said he really dug it. And he started explaining to some other people that were like kind of, you know, civilians, what what I, it was, that was remarkable. Uh, that you don't expect. That you don't expect. You just sit there and go, I just, you know, I was terrified because here's this guy who is Batman. I mean, he just was. But, um, and I didn't even want to tell him that the guy who really got me to want to draw was Marshall Rogers. I mean, that's, that's the guy who got me going. And that was because I was a huge fan of his. And he looks so different, you know. And um, when I got there, I was lucky to be around people who, you know, Archie Gooder and Denny O'Neill, who would just say, they didn't say, you're doing great. They would say, why are you doing this? And it's one of those questions that's open-ended. It can mean anything. What they wanted was, no, was I committed to this or was I trying to just be a hipster dude? Right. And I didn't know what hipster dudes were because I was still thinking 1972. You know, it's like, but when stuff, you know, at that time, I looked so different. They, they put out, I remember there was this thing about uh, everyone, they wanted everyone to really kind of take a stock in what they were doing and see, except me, they just let me be alone, you know? And I knew some other artists were getting upset saying, well, how come Kelly gets to be alone? 
And I was out here, so I had no connection with these people. And I didn't want them to think, well, I'm sitting there telling them what I'm going to do. I just, the, Doug would write it. Denny would love it. it. You just, it would happen. And I, uh, I all I ever heard after I would give my answers on why I drew the way I did or why I did a character the way I did was they go, okay, you're thinking about it. You know, you're you're not trying to just I I think what also helped me was, like I said, I didn't tell the writers what to write. They just said, write it. And and I don't want big booga booga shots. Just give me a story and I'll let me pace it. Let me figure out how to do it. Let, that's my angle. I used to love to put designs in Batman, little beginning shots, little ending shots, chapter breaks and all that, because I was trying to do the 40s. It wasn't like it, I invented this, but I loved a decorated book. It felt like you got more. So I'm, I'm interested in how you would approach like your page layouts if you were doing thumbnails or something like that. But now that you mentioned like the scripts, what did, was, was it almost Marvel method that you were able to like pace the stories or break them down? A lot yourself? of it was a lot of it was Doug would and I would talk about it and then he would write, you know, Primarily, I said, give me give me the emphasized dialogue. Make, work on that and then kind of tell me where they're at. But when I'm laying out a page, the first thing I do is do the last panel because that's the one that turns it. So I wanted whatever it was going to be, it was going to be dramatic or important and it make you go. And so every, I still do that to this day. Um, I will read a script and I'll, I'll mark it up to where I think where things will go a lot of times writers can't read me because what they think is a big panel is not a big panel to me it's a regular panel what's a big panel to me might be something that they would never figure but i think it gives i think it gives their stories a better emphasis it's like doing italics when you write you know it emphasizes a word that's what i'm trying to do is is give pa several panels in a book some kind of emphasis um there's times uh like right now i'm uh I'm working on on doing really clean graphic rough work. I want I want it still very graphic, but I want it a little rougher on uh, to to fit the story I'm doing. When I'm doing Dracula, I'm I want uh, I want all the things I loved, and I don't mean what I watched or saw, but all the things I loved that made a comic book great. I want them again, and it's impossible to do four color printing anymore. So I have to imitate it. I want primary colors. I want um, I want heavy textures that you can see what they are and the colors and, you know, really none of the airbrushy effects, none of the flares, none of that stuff. I think people naturally gravitate to that graphic nature of a comic. The, the lines are rhythmic. The 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 spotting of blacks, a really good composition. They, they don't need all the other stuff. And I think the other stuff is to hide that they don't do it. You know, oh, absolutely. or that they don't think that way. Uh, let me ask a San Francisco, I mean, a Sacramento related question, because you named some mm. names. But I do wonder if you had any interactions with uh, any of the Mad Men of Sacramento. I'm thinking Tim Vigil. I'm thinking uh, Chris <laughs> Silver of Silver Wolf uh, Graphics. Like, yes. uh, did those guys ever approach you? So, you well, you... not really approaching me, but I knew them. And you got to remember, I started around 18 or 19. I just, out of the gate, they, I did not know that was going to happen. I sent stuff in thinking they'd tell me, what do you think? You know, here's here's what you're doing wrong, or here's right. what you need to work on. And I sent it to DC, too. So on the day they hired me, uh, the first, in the morning I got the mail, and, and Ernie Cullen said, no. <laughs> you know, you, you have this wrong, this wrong, this wrong. I can see something there, but you you have these things wrong. And that was my first time, not as a disappointment, that like, oh, I got to think about this, because... Marshall Rogers had told me, I think you could do this now. And I was like 16 or 17 then. I was really, I wasn't, it was because of him that I sent stuff in. But later that day, I get a thing from Marvel saying, we want to hire you as the inker on, for Butch Guys. He he really likes your work. I Ralph Macchio was the editor, really like your work. We're going to send some stuff to you next. It was on Halloween of 82 or something. And I remember being so excited and then the reality of what it was hit me like then my heart i just sunk so i started that early and then i think it shocked all the people you're talking about i mean here we're all just sort of drawing on placemats at the pizza joint or we're talking movies and comics and stuff 
And all of a sudden I had to tell him I was doing this, you know, and getting published. And all my, uh, the guys who ran the comic book stores, it was like, not like they said, oh, you can't do it. They were just shocked. At first they all thought I was bullshitting. And I had to bring, you know, the little note that Ralph wrote me. And the, and then I brought, I showed him Butch's pages when they came. But, um, so I knew all these guys. And so when they were actually creating a lot of cool stuff, I was already in the grind at, at Marvel. Um, and they probably were shocked as I was. <laughs> you know, I was like going, dudes, I don't know. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, and... What happened was it got it got to the point to where uh, the influence of that community um, was one of the factors, not the main one, but it was one of the factors why I went from Marvel to DC. I wanted more freedom. Um, I was I was making a lot of money, but under contract and the contracts, I never sign one again because they you, you're stuck. Right. You, you all of a sudden you're you, security's the last thing an artist needs absolute last thing the only security you need is to know that you want to do it the next day and never care how the book turns out i mean i mean turn it what you do but how it fans react because these things have a long lifespan and it might be that they don't get it now but they'll get it later so fascinating to think about that Sacramento pedigree because there are through lines. I, Bernie Wrightson comes to mind uh, when I yeah. look at your work, obviously, like yeah. the, uh, Vigil, Sam Keith to, to some extent. Uh, well, what we had here, and, and this isn't usually spoken about, what we had here was a chain of comic book stores called Comics and Comics where Bud Plant was the uh, secret partner. So it wasn't like a regular comic book shop. You go in there, it'd be original Jeff Jones art on the wall. Wow. There would be original rights and stuff on the wall. There would be Barry Windsor Smith and Neil Adams because Bud could go get that stuff. He had he would send the guys I know, um, uh, all my comic book shop guys who ran it, the managers there, they would go back east. They, they went to the studio when it was all those guys for that two years and did a big buy. Um, I was buying a look back. They were able to get copies of this stuff. And a rich, I have, um, God, on my wall over here, I have all these original Christopher Enterprise posters that Wrightson had done signed. But it, I got them at the time. There's only 100, and I got one. But it was Gus of Bud Plant. So we all saw this. We congregated. And so they were art heavy. That You had underground guys. Robert Crumb would come up and buy. So we got to see everything. We saw underground. We saw mainstream. We saw European. Bud could get it all. And Bud was really good at pushing everything. And so uh, these guys would let me sit in the back room and just read and read and read. That's how I discovered EC Comics. I, I came in there as some kid saying, oh, this whoever artist is the best guy in the world. And they said, no, I'm here. <laughs> and sat me down and let me read Wallywood stuff from EC. Uh, uh, Al Williamson, Frazetta, all these guys are comics. And I came out of there very chastised and realizing... But it influenced my inking a huge amount when I saw Wally Wood. That is and I owe, I owe those guys. So it is, I have to say, it was a, it's why I miss that kind of culture in a comic book shop. We say it all the time because we have a really good comic scene here in Pittsburgh, you know, with yeah. shops that go back to the 70s. And it's like, you can take it for granted if that's what you grow up around. But a lot of places yeah. don't have anything like that. Nothing, nothing. And and I think that it, it you can see it affect comic book creators if you can you know you can see isolated and just imitating what you like or you can see being influenced by others and i used to be very sam keith and i used to really be influenced by each other i do something he'd like he'd do something i like and we were uh we were very simpatico on a lot of things he he got very influenced by uh the kind of inking and undergrounds to establish light effects and I became very influenced by EC Comics on how to do lighting effects. Um, but lighting was the big thing. We wouldn't talk about light. We didn't talk about figure drawing and all that crap. We talked about how do you get and establish something with light? How do you, um, what kind of line work works best to do that? When do you get rough? When do you get clear? I remember Sam saying that the big, uh, we were, he came and he saw something I was doing and he liked the inking on a lot. And he says, um, how did and he did a great question? He says, "How did you come to this?" And I said, "Well, uh, 
I didn't want the lines all perfect anymore. So I started breaking them up and let some feathering lines long, some small, but they all they all mushed into the black, right? It was the light into the black, the black into the light. And he goes, yes, because he had just come to that same conclusion of not trying to be Rudy Nebrez, but try to be, you know, um, Jackson or Spain or Crumb kind of line work. And so probably that's that's why we... We both came in at the same time, kind of happened at the same time, him at Marvel, me at DC, being throwbacks. But we didn't know we were throwbacks. And the people we were working with, uh, the editors and stuff, they knew this stuff. They knew those guys who were doing it. So, I mean, far better than me. Uh, it, so I think that really that really fueled it. Sacramento and... Bud Plant and those comic book stores is the reason it happened. We would go down to the Bay Area. It was wild down there then. And it was pure comics, the best stores, the best shops. Um, it was just everywhere. You, 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 it was in the air. Um, uh, I used to go down there and there were the best bookstores. There was a poster shop that was just, I, I miss it to this day, movie poster shop. Um, it was everything and it was all the cool stuff and it was we were a subculture we didn't know we were subculture it's like bowlers are a subculture and you know there's this thing there's our own language there's our own ebb and flow things that turn us on uh we it's so much so that um i used to have to tell girlfriends at the time what i meant by certain language or what we were talking about because they wouldn't have no clue you know it would be it would be bizarre and the things we'd get excited about were never the things that everyone else got excited about, you know? Never. That's the basis of the channel, man. And, and, and there <laughs> yeah. are often times, because we do have a lot of makers on, on the in the audience, but a lot of civilians co come through or just yeah. uh, fans. So when it comes to the language, and we're looking at, say, Jaime, Jaime Hernandez pages or something, and we're talking yeah. about spotting blacks, we have yep. to explain what that is, man. Yes. Got, yeah. Got, well, got, got to explain to the 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 average viewer. I had saying. a great I had a great period. There was that I was doing a book. I think it was Dark Joker or something. And I wasn't that wasn't written for me. It was written for someone else who bailed on it. And then they said, "Can you come in and do it?" And they delayed what I was going to do. So I if I would do it. And I at that point I said, "Sure." I read it. It was terrific. It was a lot of fun. It was very different for me. But what happened was it was late because the guy bailed on him and waited and waited and waited before he would he ghosted him and that was the end of it. So I took it and I penciled my ass off. And at one point they said, you, can you come in? John, John Beatty had wanted to work with me. We had done a thing that never got published for Archie called The Hangman. And it was beautiful. And the publisher saw it and said, no way are we publishing this. And okay. But it established me a connection to John who was an ace inker at the time. I mean, he was, all the greats were calling for him, you know, Byrne and Golden and Ordway, everybody. Zach, I, so I was flattered as hell that he wanted to work with me. And that was the first pro that did. So what what I loved was at, at a time, he was getting later and later. DC flew me out to Florida where he lived and we just sat there and for 10 days just jammed. Just he, his board, he got me a board. We just sat and talked and inked all day and we made the deadline. Through that time, this long story gets to the point, was he taught me terms, right? Because he was such a professional artist. He had worked with all the greats. Uh, and he would say, you know, you got to be careful with this zipatone because you don't want some moray. And I go, what moray? Is that the eel or what? And he goes, no, how it will make these weird patterns that you're not intending. He used to throw stuff at me all the time. And I felt like such a moron. I, ca I came back and my wife says, oh, so how was that? I go, man, I should have went to school <laughs> because I, I was learning terms. I use my own colloquialisms, you know, my own. Um, uh, but then what what? John, what I would do to John was scare the shit out of him because I he said you work without a net. He's all very, and I would go, oh, I can't. I'm not getting this cloud I want, so I dip my finger in ink and just go bang, 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 and then I get it. He goes, ah, <laughs> what are you doing? And I go, you know, whatever makes the page looks good in print, John. That's what I'm doing. And uh, another, and he, and I went and I said, uh, 
do we have time to go to the store? He says, no, not right now. I We got to get this thing. Get, all right, fine. So I just went and got my toothbrush and I'm doing toothbrush stuff. Now he knew about it, but he'd never seen it done. And I'm not really frisketing and forming. I'm just, and then I'll white out what I need. To. He's like, God, no, what are you, you know, but at the end he says, I like your results. You know, I like it. I said, Sam Keith and I used to, I told him, I said, Sam Keith and I used to know that when our pages were done, they were thick because we just kept going over it and over it. And what I, and that kind of bravery, when you're attacking the stuff, just thinking how it looks in the printed page, I don't care what it is on my board. Um, but I remember Sam just couldn't get this panel right. It looked great to me, but okay. Um, he couldn't get it and he would do it again and he would do it again and he kept, and it was getting, finally says, enough of this shit. And he says, do you have a pair of scissors? And he just cut it out of the page. He just cut it out, drew something else, pasted it in and i went you know that that looks really great um the son of a bitch threw that i wanted to keep what he cut out but he chucked it really quick and i i know it's gone you know he tore it up or whatever <laughs> sam's a great emotional artist but he's very controlled i'm an emotional artist and that's probably we got, why we got along because it would be this explosion of it i mean we really dug the life of making these things, you know, to the exclusion of all else. And um, we were the only ones seeing it, right? It wasn't like we thought everybody's gonna see it or now they tell you to post stuff and get a reaction. Um, I'm terrible at shilling. I'm really good though at, at being a fan. That's what I do. Um, and that's what Sam was. We would talk about the people we liked and stuff we loved and, um, uh, it, it, those were good days. Salami pizza in my kitchen inking was a great period. That I sounds amazing. I love those ideas. I mean, it's like iron sharpens iron. And uh, yeah. I, I think about like, you know, that's that's an approach. And, you know, we got the Pittsburgh crew here and, you know, the, you could see some through lines and things. But then mm -hmm. I, I think about like these remote geniuses like a Richard Corbin, who who's like an alchemist with his color and all that stuff, yep. kind of creating his whole own thing with zero p like in what kansas or something right. like in the middle of nowhere i think i think what happens what happens is we we people uh you know how you get somewhere is a weird thing anyway and i think then um with richard we used to separate the wheat from the chaff the people who thought he was cool they were cool <laughs> the people who didn't get it all right, go go enjoy your. We knew they'd be out of comics anyway because they would read a little bit and then they get bored and move on. But we all wanted it. Uh, where my where my my wife is a civilian, but where she became a fan. I'm doing this for years. She could care less. She sees the den segment in heavy metal and says that's really good. I said, well, if you really like that, let me show you something. She becomes a huge den fan, right? Huge Richard Corbin fan. Buys everything he has for herself because it's in my studio or I, I I have it in my bookshelf. She wanted her own. And I felt really bad when he passed away because I said, you know, one of these days he'll be, so I'm going to get him to sign. I, I got Milo Monaro to sign a bunch of stuff for her because she loved him too. So she starts with this avant garde, which I can't keep up with. You know, I'm like going, okay, I'm with you for all these years and now you're getting it. And now, but you go right to the cream of the crop, you know? And, uh, but it's good because those guys speak man it is so personal richard corbin is so personal that you know he's doing this for himself absolutely we just happen to be uh, he's letting us uh peek over his shoulder that that's a genius too that's a brave man didn't care did you ever meet richard no i sp we spoke uh over the computer i had told him how much he had changed up his style on something and i really liked it he went really high contrast on some stuff and I just, I told him, I said, you pick every line you choose is correct. There's no mistaking it. Um, and I said, that's that's the work of a master. Um, just perfect. When he got that presidency thing for, for Angoulême, and he didn't go to France, I don't no. think, but he did a little video, and you can find that on YouTube. And yeah. they kind of glance by, and they show all of his sculpture that he uses for Den and, and to light yeah. his figures and stuff. And, yeah. and, and the sculptures look like his drawings. It's pretty cool. But listen, I for, think that's what he probably wanted to be first, right? An animation yeah. he would talk about? Like yeah. Just a Renaissance guy. But uh, we, uh, 
we want to promote that that Dracula comic that I've been hearing about a little bit online. A little we, bit. And we brought uh, Uncle Matt Wagner. Well, you've Wagner. seen it, right? You guys have seen it? Read it, yes. loved it. We have Uncle Matt Wagner in the house. So, Uncle Matt! So now is the part where <laughs> I could... Uh, Pull, pull both your pants down and just start sucking you guys off because, <laughs> <laughs> because it is incredible. Kel Kelly, the art that you're uh, bringing to the presentation, uh, when I was talking to Jimmy about this off cam, uh, it's like, and and please do not take this in the wrong way whatsoever, but, but, but it's like when Tony Hawk was 40 years old doing the 900 and teaching all the fucking kids check this out man I, I am i am here i'm i'm still a, a fucking badass yep. and I think, uh, I think kelly will take that one i think i'll take it i think well I look think masterpiece is not a, a word that we use lightly around here and i think you guys are you're doing what you're supposed to and and it is incredible to watch well thank, thank you, you. Thank you. I think I think uh, like I told you earlier, I compete with 1972, 73, 74, and Matt gave me that. He gave me this. It felt like heavy metal. It, it felt like to. I mean, he said that once, but it felt like I was getting that kind of a raw, powerful, visceral thing with a literary edge, and um, uh, I don't think we've seen that in a very long time. And I say that from reading the script. I knew when I got it that this was, it, I. he told me on the phone, it knocked me out. But when I got it, it was like fully formed and it was, it, it, I love a script I get and they're rare to get where you know any monkey could draw it and would be awesome. Okay, you know it when you got it. I love a script that intimidates me because it's obviously demanding me, not by details and, it's it just it, the emotion, the power of it. And I'm not a guy. I, I wanted to make sure everything he did, all the beats he had, all the this power that was in it was there. And and he did something cool because Dracula, we all know Dracula. What are you going to do? And you read this and I know I'm going, this is utterly original. I've not read this Dracula. I've not seen this Dracula. And it feels more Dracula than anything I've seen in a long, long time. You guys, Kelly said any monkey could draw that script. Okay, maybe so. But <laughs> the entire time I'm writing it, I'm writing it to Kelly's strengths. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, God, Kelly's going to draw the fucking shit out of this. And then and then the art would come back and it's like way better than I expected even. <laughs> you know? So it was just a an absolute joy in every, in every I think it's like we always work together. That's yeah, what it is. It, it literally think... felt like I mean we've known each other for decades. Yes. Doing this, it felt like we were still working together. No, together. and and I think I think it's it's one of those very natural um uh, finishing each other's sentences creatively. That's how it felt. Very few great collaborations where everybody to a man or woman is in sync with everybody else yeah. and and i put this up there down to jose's color and yeah. uh it's been a long time since we had a well matt gets credit like matt that's where matt's artistic eye comes in because matt had clearly said what kind of colors he wanted on me and he told me i said okay i hope i can get that i've tried and it's very hard to get and i can get close to it but i but I, uh, he, um, so you he, guys, what he's talking about there is, I mean, as long, as long as I've loved Kelly's art, I've always been just entirely disappointed with the way people color him because, you know, Kelly's got this incredible atmospheric mood to his work and everybody's like, oh, he's dark and spooky. I'm going to color it dark and spooky. And my attitude is always like, no, he's already got that there. You don't, you don't need to add anything to it. So his stuff should be colored, uh, vibrantly, you know? And, uh, so we see all the, uh, we see all the shadows, you know? And so when, when Jose came on board, and of course, Jose, uh, we immediately thought of him because of uh, the restoration work he's recently been doing on uh, Rights and Swamp Thing, and also on the restoration work he's been doing on Corbin. You guys were talking about Corbin when I came on screen here. And uh, I said, I explained this to Jose, and I said, look, we're looking for something like Italian giallo films, you know, specifically something like Dario Argento's uh, Suspiria, or uh, Mario, specific, very specifically, Mario Baba's uh, Black Sabbath, both of which are lit up like neon pinball machines, yep. and they're spooky as shit, you know? Yeah. And, uh, boy, he got that. <laughs> he totally got that vibe and ran with it, and it, it's so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to say, 
that where uh, I was ready to give notes. I uh, every time I'd see it, his stuff come in. I had no notes. Matt would give detailed little things, maybe a thing here, maybe a thing there for storytelling purposes. But the choices were all there. If 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 nothing, if they just were as they were, I was in heaven. But that's the that's where sometimes I need Matt's eye because I'm such a fan first. And Matt's, you can see my background, fanboy. Matt's <laughs> professional <laughs> comics, creator, you know. Um, so, I always say I always say my role in the team is I'm the storytelling bitch. I'm the, uh, I'm the guy that's always like, has, wait I'll a minute, you, two panels ago that that you know, no, nope, we gotta. You know. you know, and Matt's Matt has this. Uh, if they when they finally you know take his brain out, they'll find a big part of it was an editor in there. There's a little editor <laughs> fold in the brain because he has a great as you're in the moment editing eye. And I let uh, my my strength and my weakness is I'm emotional when I'm doing it, and sometimes I'll miss it. And Matt would say, "Hey, that's great, no," and he but he would <laughs> tell me why, and I would go, "Yeah, that's better." And when it was done, I go, "That's better." Um, so so that you be I trust him with telling the story. I trust him, and his artistic sense was Jose. I mean that that right there. And I and I looked at the first batch that came in. And uh, no special effects, just a guy's talent, just his choices of color. And I went, man, that is a long time since I've seen that. It yes, is very uh, exciting to see that color approach on your artwork. Is it's Matt shot Shady. every 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 sequence. Matt writes in sequences, so if you you know it now, there's this sequence leads to the, that sequence leads to the next sequence, and Jose would bring this vibrancy to each sequence. So it wasn't just the same monolithic homogenized coloring. He would he would move with Matt the way Matt moved with the writing, he would move with the atmosphere of the situation. So when you're in the battlefield it's wild. When you're in the mystical forest, it goes all greens and very very uh supernatural looking, but bright. Everything he did was bright and it made uh, the the weird thing it made the book darker because you could see all my inks you could yeah. see everything yeah. Matt had that's, said that's the key you gotta you you put you have, you have such finesse and such eloquence in your inks it's like oh god I hate it when somebody would put dark colors on it and they just clawed up yeah. you know and and now you can see your inks and it's just remarkable it, but it, you know, I, we were talking there about the uh, me being the storytelling bitch here's and, and you know the the uh, the level of communication that Kelly and I enjoy um. We redid that first page, which turned out being just beautifully iconic. We did we re, bleh, we redid it three times. Yep. Because Kel went off my description from the script the first time, and I was like, eh, and tried something else. I was like, eh. <laughs> but what just, was... just, I sent him just a little scribble. I was like, maybe something like this. And boy, he just took that and shot it to literally to the what, moon. On, what uh, what Matt did is something that Doug mentioned once explained to me that that the first page of a comic, if it's a Batman, Batman should be on it because he was telling on some other guys they weren't. They, but you're dealing with that. So when Matt was saying it, he wasn't having to explain some brand new thought. It was like, he's right. First page has to be this thing. And certainly the others were serviceable. They would have been, but never as good as that. I kept them as... You know, I, I'd not like I'd ever get rid of it, but I kept them as a reminder, you know, of process. Right. It is. And it's it's and Matt's probably lucky, too, that my big hero is Stanley Kubrick, who says you either want it. Do you do you want it right or not at all? Would you care or do you not? Right. So everyone have to go and work and work and work and work. But dude, I'm not going to make you draw stuff 127 times. Don't no, worry. he won't do that. <laughs> but but I have a big poster of Stanley over my head while I'm working. And when I do that and I'm starting to feel, I look up and I think that's why I love his stuff. And, and, um, and I think it comes to trust. If you just, if you're lucky enough, the team we have in place is, I agree, wonderful. And I think we all trust each other. It's as simple as that. How does that, no one, how does that team come together? Like, like, did, did you guys get together, want to work together and then come up with this project or Matt, did you have this project mapped out and then find people? How do you guys get together on this? Ke Kelly and I met many, many years ago when we were both contributing to, uh, uh, the seasons of mist, uh, story arc and Sandman. 
uh, was first at a con and then at a couple store signings. And we just kind of hit it off immediately because we, you know, we both have a love for horror fiction in all its many forms and we have a common sense of humor. It just, everything clicked. Bourbon? <laughs> there, that too. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, uh, we'd always intended to do something significant over the years, but, you know, your individual lives, your individual careers kind of push you in different directions and it just, the time was never right. And a year and a half, two years ago, I had posted something on Facebook and Kelly contacted me with that same old echo of, we really got to do something together someday. Yeah. But at this point, I'd been stewing on this Dracula stuff for enough uh, years and I finally had what I thought was my take on it. And so I contacted him and said, are you serious, man? Because I, I got that th what I think is the perfect thing for us that will be, you know, a, like a real, real sublime collaboration. Uh, but it's going to take a commitment of years. You know, we're, we're, we have mapped out to do four of these graphic novels. So we're looking at, you know, four to five years worth of uh, uh, commitment. And uh, he said, well, let me hear what you got. And I said, well, all right, let me, let me get all my thoughts in presentable order. And uh, called him shortly after that. And we chatted through it first. And you can take it from there, Cal. <laughs> and so at that point, uh, when we were starting to put it together, uh, lettering wise, I've been working with Rob Lee and Rob was brilliant on me. I'm an overdrawer. I get involved and just I have to make that panel look good for me and then let everyone else try to pound it into where do we, you know, the writer has to figure out what do, do I cut something or whatever. Rob knew where to place balloons. Rob and actually, I think I think we had settled on Rob before Jose. Oh, yeah, long before. Yeah, and yeah. and I, I was saying how much. I admired Rob really likes good art and he's a natural proofreader. So I learned that with him beforehand. He could, he could spot things ahead of time. Um, and so he would place things so beautifully. And then I just loved his, when he would letter, it was beautiful. And then his special effects were great. And um, uh, at that point I went, I, okay, this is the guy I always want to work with. Cause he's saving my butt a lot of times with, with my, overdrawing uh so i told matt about that matt checked him out and said yeah okay when the coloring came to it we didn't really know but matt had this philosophy so matt was looking around and when he mentioned jose it was like wow if we can get him we'll give him a shot well jose would jumped at it he saw the yeah. art and he yeah like right away i contacted yeah. jose and i said hey man i want to talk to you about something and he said what and i told him and he's like yes yeah <laughs> yeah uh he got a hold of me and said this is like you know uh what I've always kind of wanted. This is the stuff I always wanted. And, and, and we knew um, Jose wouldn't overcolor it, you know? No. I mean, there's a few instances of some computer ishness to it, but it's just not overcolored. Like a lot of when I look at contemporary comics, I know you guys dig the old school of coloring techniques and coloring theory. And, uh, and boy, Jose just really brought that to the table. I like to say it's classic. Mm -hmm. I know I, I don't like to, I don't care about the terms old school's fine but I like classic because I know that Jose looked at it and he saw that really cool 70s vibe and that's what he told me this this looks like that but it's brand new he says I want to be with something like this so he asked me things I didn't want to I didn't want to um influence him too much so I just stuck to what Matt was saying bright look at this stuff um and let's see what you do. You're not. I told. I I told him a few times. You're not a one and done guy. If if it's not. If it's if it, the philosophy's there, but we need to. It, fine, but don't worry that you got to hit it right out of the park. We're figuring it out too. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had told him. I said, since no one's going to do what we're doing, since no one's doing what we're doing right now, it will look brand new. Mm -hmm. It will shock people. I think. You hope. And then when I first saw the stuff come in, I told Matt, this is this is absolutely uh, exceeding our uh, our dreams on this. What, we got what to plan. talk to Jose at Baltimore, I don't know, a month ago, maybe or something. And he was very excited about the book and was describing yeah. certain parts, you know, that, that we've now seen. Well, Jose gets uh, to be an artist. See it. Yeah. yeah, he gets to be an artist. That's really what it is. He gets to, his contribution is every bit as important because he gets to be, he's not supporting me or fixing me. He's he's reading it and wanting to get the same thing in there. You can see it. I think that's the same for for all of you because uh you know this you 
Kelly, you talked about like having no safety net. Uh, you guys don't have an editor uh, looking over you. Uh, well, we do. Okay. <laughs> we do. <laughs> <laughs> let's uh, let's let's talk a little bit about about the process of this thing. Now, there's a Kickstarter in place right now. It's going to be going on for a little while, but. Jimmy and I read the book, so this is not that vaporware kind of uh, comic uh, project where the, the the first book is done, uh, yeah. presumably done on spec for yeah. uh, for this. It was absolutely this, and not only that, we're we're about halfway through the second one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This this is a great point because like you guys have giant track records. I assume we could probably name a dozen publishers that would have given you advances given you money for this already why do this on your own what what prompted that direction well, they'd have told matt no they'd have said no matt that's great but you're going too far <laughs> or matt did, you know that, that that i wanted nothing encumbering me and sometimes you want to remind yourself am i an artist or not not a comic book guy making money i wanted to be an artist and I, you know, i'm i'm not so much worried about that because that's kind of always the way i i walk into the room and yeah. uh what it really appealed to me again, I, I've, I've kind of been in the vanguard of indie publishing since its inception, and this whole Kickstarter thing is just a new facet of that, you know, and I really wanted to try that out and see what it was like, and this just seemed the perfect opportunity. Uh, number one, because Kelly and I, we're in a position where we could do it on spec, as you said, and, and we wanted to line up the four books and, and work towards that, you know, and Kickstarter just seemed to be kind of the way to go now. Well, I think also I I'm looking at the, at that, you know, when they size you up career wise, I wanted something more than just, and, and I'm happy with it, but I wanted something more than Batman. I wanted, I wanted, I wanted something like this. I hoped for something like this. And then when it came, it, all the other questions of how to do it went away. It was like, um, uh, I remember going, Matt wanted it a different size, so I had to go buy a paper cutter. I had to go buy the paper. I measured it. I mean, I'm doing all this physical stuff I never do. Um, it was a total pleasure. I mean, yeah, it, um, in, uh, to specify there, it's uh, it's going to be eight and a half by 11, so European album size, not uh, Amer standard American comic size. And it works. It, it's, it, it gave me more room, actually. It's creepy I eerie felt, size. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, like creepy and eerie. Let's let's talk about the realities of of this this uh, commitment for for you, Kelly. Like, how long did we spend drawing this this uh, this first issue or the first book? For I want to say, um, if I if I were to just say in, in in real time, about five or six months, you know. Uh, and, that's that's and, another nice thing here is neither of us are uh, neither of us fret and worry about what we do. No. You know what I mean? We, we, we sit down and we produce. We know our aims. We know our goals. And, you know, I knew when I was working with Kelly, it wasn't going to be like four years later, I'm finally getting book one wrapped up. I was right. like, no, yeah. Kelly's going to sit down and draw this fucker. Yeah. And, and he did. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, I, because I was so enjoying the process of just, like I was saying earlier, uh, production is everything. It, things grow in that. If you spend too much time, it it, it calcifies. So the emotion yeah. helped. You know, people said we're asking me, well, how did you come up with Dracula? How how are you going to present Dracula? And I said, well, Matt wrote him so clearly in my head that it didn't. I didn't have to sit and design him all day. It was like, oh, I see him. Yeah. And yeah, when I mean, you're there's already an established uh, uh, template for Dracula to some degree. And well, I'm talking about just how he carries himself. Yes, right. You know? yeah. uh, I'm talking about the look in his eye, the his angle of his head. The, there, to me, it's all uh, uh, almost um, uh, motive, it, 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 method acting. So yeah, right. The right. best way I can put it. So I never worry about what I think. A lot of people worry about the doodads on an outfit. I figured 15th century. I'll go look and see what they wore. That that kind of hems you in. Um, the other, the real part to me in designing character is those things. They're very intangible. So, but they're the things you know and you remember. And I think it, it, if if there's something I did was Matt would do something and emphasize it, and I am able to get it to work in the picture in in the in the panel without knowing what he's saying. You know he's saying something. You know it means something. You know there's a beat there that emphasizes it, and that's due to the fact that I believe I know who this guy is. 
Um, Kelly Kelly mentioned method acting there for uh, his characterization. You know, uh, uh, Bram Stoker's uh, life as a writer was his side hustle, right? He he was uh, his main gig was he was the uh, manager of a, uh, a theater in London uh, that had one star actor, a fellow named Henry Irving, and in fact he based uh, Dracula's uh, 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 stature, build, demeanor. Uh, appearance on Henry Irving and Irving, even though he was, you know, he was an actor, so he was not an uh, aristocrat. He still presented himself with a real snotty aristocratic bastard kind of uh, air. So mm -hmm. Kelly perfectly captured that in our Dracula. Yeah. yeah. I, I loved, I loved that relationship. Um, at least Irving read the whole novel out so they could secure copyright from anyone doing a play. Mm -hmm. uh, they just, I remember that, that, that was a kind thing he'd done. But yeah, he was a jerk. And he didn't do a lot of kind things for Stoker. No, he, he was, was a jerk to Stoker. Yeah. yeah, he was a real jerk. Um, it's kind of like the film The Dresser. He was kind of like that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, but but that's the stuff that um, that's the stuff that uh, influences my drawing. It, it going back to Dead Man and Batman. It, you act like you invent them, and it influenced how I did those. So I found success in that, and I stick to it. So when Matt would do it um in right how he was or all this stuff it i never thought oh i gotta sit here and draw pictures so i can show matt um it was like just hit the board i i, I already saw him i already knew what it was uh it'll work best when you just see him yeah and there was never there was never any uh any critiques i had were never about the drawing the drawing was yeah. always perfect it was always as i said i'm the storytelling bitch mm -hmm. so it was but always... it all works and 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 if if you can't trust the if if you can't trust who you're working with and your ego gets to the point to where it, it, that's the argument rather than the, the book, rather than the finished product. If, if, if I'm happy about anything is people will really, I think will really dig it. And it's going to be because it was just this perfect storm of creative people that got it, that just got it. We all wanted to see it this way. We didn't know what it was, but we knew we wanted to see it. So when it started happening, you get out of the way. I mean, um, and I, and part of what led to it all of it was uh, um, I can't remember if I said this earlier when we were talking. Um, you know, in in Stoker's novel, uh, Dracula is this incredibly compelling and magnetic presence, and he's not on stage all that often. Yeah. Uh, aside from the opening castle scene where Harker goes to his castle in Transylvania. Once he gets to London, he's gone. He's not on stage very much. He's this shadowy presence that kind of uh, uh, infects the the people around him. And when I was a kid and read the book, I was just like, I want more Dracula, you know. So ever after that, I, I mean, I love so many Dracula movies, and I don't think any of them are, I never thought any of them were right, were correct. Uh, so all of it was just like, well, someday I'm going to do my Dracula. And, and that turned out to be my and Kelly's Dracula. And boy... Could not be happier with the synthesis that we came up with that to my mind is is the perfect complement to stoker's original vision and in keeping with that uh we recently uh I, when we were posting stuff on uh twitter and facebook about the uh the campaign i heard from uh leslie klinger who is uh, a famous author and considered uh one of the world's foremost dracula scholars he wrote the newest annotated dracula which is exhaustively annotated uh he wrote an annotated sherlock holmes jekyll and hyde frankenstein the guy really knows his stuff and uh so i sent him the book like i sent you guys the book and he sent us this glowing response this glowing quote a blurb that we can use and i just thought wow who you know, <laughs> that guy's telling me we got it right we got it right you know? i think i think yeah well matt matt has a scholarly mind so yes he was going to the professor i just draw comics and that's why i'm happy this is my <laughs> period with you guys reacting this way i'm going okay i passed you know? i like that shit too <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I think it's important to get on the record uh in this conversation that this is not an adaptation of bram stoker's novel yeah. Absolutely, it is not. This is nope. this is not an adaptation of the novel into comics form. There are already a ton of those. Yeah, it's been adapted into comics over and over and over through the years. Yeah, and we're not doing. On, we're not... If you look on eBay and Amazon, you can find a ton of them. Yeah, we're not... telling it's... the stories around that story, the stories in the shadow of that story. It's not like anything I've read, but it's all there. It's it's cannot it's in canon, but it's it's never been told.
that's what I hoped when the people would read the book is they go, wow, I did, you know, it's all there, but it's, it's like, uh, Matt doesn't do a thing like, uh, I'm going to explain to you the folklore now. It just sort of happens. It's just sort of there and you, and it develops on its own. It's very organic. That's the best kind of storytelling. Right. Was there consideration when you guys went crowdfunding with this consideration for putting it in front of an audience that maybe doesn't find it if it's just in comic shops or through, you know, kind of traditional comics outlets? Was that something you thought about? Because this feels like a project that I think you could put it in the hands of people who have never read a comic, but love horror, love Dracula, love great art, and, and they would they would be in heaven. So is Ho that hope something yeah, you thought about? Yeah, hopefully so. I mean, you know, the the... When the when the direct sales market first arose and comic shops started uh, uh, coming into their own, you know, it was a it was a really great thing because all of a sudden you're targeting a dedicated audience, you know. Um, yeah, at the same time, over the years, much like uh, record shops, uh, it's become somewhat microcosmic, and certainly there's a there's a huge portion of your buying audience that really likes that, that likes to go into that microcosm, into that cocoon, into just be enveloped in the the world of comics. <clears throat> Other people's don't necessarily want to go there, you know, and they would yeah. much rather uh, uh, have access to this product some other way. So yeah, hopefully uh, this is going to reach other people. We've uh, we've uh, enlisted the the help of an advertising firm that's going to be advertising it online outside of uh, the confines of what we're doing. And yes, like I said, hopefully uh, hopefully this will appeal to uh horror fans literature fans uh we've done a ton of interviews uh with various horror websites you know not comics websites um you know i mean i keep saying arguably dracula is the most famous literary character of all time you know that's 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 a, a huge leg up in getting into the, in the hands of readers you know Let's talk about some of this infrastructure behind uh, the comic. Like when, when I mean, obviously the the original goal on the Kickstarter was six hundred sixty six dollars. <laughs> Far exceeded that. A little, by, a uh, little facetious there, uh, I will admit. Of, yes. of, of course, but uh, you guys got a long road ahead of you production wise. I can't imagine you're going to be stuffing envelopes and shipping these books off by hand. So, so what's what's that part of the procedure look like you you enlist a fulfillment service we, we have somebody that's that's doing that for us yeah i, I don't want i don't want all those things stacked well, up i want to i want to make sure these things are packed properly so people get them in pristine condition yeah and, yeah that too yeah you know, and, and, Matt, and as I'm, a result we're dealing with people that that know that we get we get greasy hands on everything and spill our coffee and whatnot so well, you got to get someone who does what they're doing kelly you got the toothbrush spatter man so we got to keep that yeah, far I away from these pristine uh, new books i got ink on my hands spatter and, yeah and he uses his fingerprints a lot if you look at that first page the clouds are all fingerprint rendering it's awesome yeah. don't tell him man i was going to use that to get into his iphone <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can't uh, commit a crime man if uh if for your various viewers that haven't looked at the kickstarter page yet uh so we have two different editions of the main uh book one with uh, a cover by kelly one with a cover by me we have a sign and limited edition as well. And then we have a portfolio of, uh, uh, so same size as the original art, 11 by 17, um, seven plates from the uh, interior artwork of the book that are all just real hot shit examples of Kelly's magnificent art. Uh, each of them then has a, uh, a caption, uh, a very uh, evocative caption at the bottom that's taken directly from my script on that page. So, uh, you know, trying to, Trying to not overload people with opportunities, you know, not too much swag, but uh, I think it's a pretty nice spread of uh, product available. So this video, yeah, it's, oh, go ahead. Kevin. As if it, you know, if it grows, we'll do more. I mean, it's just how it yeah. how it yeah. is. If people show an interest, we'll do more. This vid uh, has gone live uh, October 29th on on Sunday uh, is when we put this out to the public. Uh, so uh, when does the Kickstarter kind of um, crowdfund end? And uh, is there a time frame where people could start to expect to, to get their copies? So uh, it's it ends three weeks. Okay. Yeah, November twenty first or something like that. It says uh, on the page. Yeah, it's got twenty one days to go. Um, uh, but Ed, you mentioned their production and printing. Even though we're done with our end, you know the the fact is, you know, production runs slow and printing runs really slow these days. 
So uh, it's about a year from now is when the book will find its way into people's hands. Um, it actually ships from the printer, I want to say July? June, I thought it was around June. June or July, and then by the time it gets to American Shores and, uh, you know, to the fulfillment service and then shipped out to everybody, all that shit just adds up yeah. day after day, week after week. But, well, we're, um, we're, we, I've said it before, we're like planes waiting to land. You all have to get in row because they're, uh, everybody's printing and it is, it, you, if, if I were not done with this, I would be going nuts Worried, yeah yeah because yeah and the good the good news to that is again we're we're forging right ahead with the when number with, when two comes up it'll be done yeah that's just the that's just the way to do it it has yeah. to be done when you hit these things it has to be finished yeah i mean that's a professional approach man yeah. uh, especially with inflation and things man if you start yeah. soliciting yeah. before you draw well, the damn thing you can be forgiven a lot but you can't be forgiven for wasting time right uh I, I we we're at the whims of the printing industry and everything else but the stuff matt and i control we did it yes and we didn't take a million years we handled it and um you just got to go on people's good graces that they understand that you know and additionally this is this is just the approach i've always had throughout my professional life you know i've seen sadly seen so many of my colleagues take money up front for gigs and you know then they get lost in a black hole and they've spent the money and they still have to do all that work and i've just been adamant throughout my entire career i do not inv invoice for something until it's done mm -hmm. and uh similarly i've had dear friends that have run very successful kickstarter campaigns and boom they're not done and they get lost in that same black hole and they generate an enormous amount of ill will Mm -hmm. And we were just determined, nope, we are not going down that road. We're going to be done before before we even mentioned well, it. I took the fact that when I was when I'm working for Marvel or DC or whatever, I wasn't going to give them anything more to criticize me on. If I'm doing weird ears in the cape, but they can't say, and you're late or you're <laughs> right, right. all yeah. all my professional cues were hit. So I would go, um, OK, it's on time. Right. Well, I knew a lot of other guys aren't on time. Yeah. So. Uh, so you hit your professional marks, and then that way it cuts down any crap because you can come right back and say, uh, so what you're saying is if I give you time, you're going to criticize me, right? That's what I used to say to editors. Um, you get If I'm on time, you're done criticizing. You're done with anything more. You can say it while I'm doing it, but not when it's done. I do not go back and take mm -hmm. the same ground twice. And that was that. Um, so in doing this, I just I, I can't change. I, I don't believe extra time makes something better. I think extra time ruins stuff. I think you need to, Matt knew that it needed, you know, he was waiting for it. Uh, I have to respect Matt gave me a big, thick script. So I knew he was working on it. And he just doesn't, it's not just the time it took him to type it. He did enormous amounts of research. Um, so you gotta, you, you don't pay a guy back by then dicking around. Fantastic. Have you guys put in more time selling this project than than a typical book that you've Must done in have. the past? Yeah, it sure feels like it right now. That's for sure. It's the hardest part. <laughs> the hardest part is this: it wasn't redoing the first page three times. It's <laughs> yeah, we got you guys up at ten a.m. Uh, bright and early, man, uh, to uh, to do some. I'm always, dude. I'm married to a teacher. I'm always up early. <laughs> yep. And my wife has her own business, so I'm always up early. Yeah. Appreciate the conversation, gentlemen. Uh, the, the audience out there, they have their marching orders uh, pledged to this Kickstarter. The work is done. The work is done. This book has happened. And abso absolutely, uh, it was a brilliant conversation. And, hey, you guys have gotten to read it. <laughs> totally. And and uh, Kelly, it was super fun to chat with you in that in that uh, you know t tiny way. But we have to mm -hmm. have you back on the show, get, get a little bit broader. Certainly. You with... guys just say when and where and I'll do it. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining us, and I'm sure. Hey, I, thanks for having you, us on, guys. You, know, you must have another interview at, ele at, at, at noon or eleven yes. today. Five, five, five o'clock. <laughs> you have another one? Is there another one today? Yeah, five o'clock. <laughs> okay. Cheers, guys. Yeah, thanks, Matt and Kelly, and good thanks. luck. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell so that we can notify you when new videos are available. We are a daily YouTube channel with more than 1,500 videos at your disposal. We might have talked about some of your favorites, so search for your favorite uh, comics on the front page of the Kayfabe YouTube channel. Hit the magnifying glass, search for your favorites, check out those episodes. If we did not talk about your favorite comics, you have to let us know in the comments so that we can push your faves a little bit higher up on our uh, two read piles and make those uh, 
episodes for you as soon as possible. The Patreon exists for the King Kayfabers to get all of the videos before anybody else does. Uh, it mitigates the kayfabe effect. The things that we talk about on this channel, things like uh, the, you know the Escapo trade paperback, whatever, uh, they become very expensive if you can even find them online at all. And it's always the King Kayfabers who get earliest dibs at those copies by getting the fully produced videos, plus the live stream recording sessions that we do while we produce the videos. Ultimately, though. The videos are brought to you by the books that we make. Before You is a good smattering of uh, our bibliography. But we uh, make new comics all the time. So, Jimmy, let the people know what you got. I've been self-publishing lately. I have True Crime Funnies, a collection of three short nonfiction stories. 1986 zine is a celebration of the greatest year in comics history, 1986, looking at everything from Dark Knight to Mouse to uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and their many ripoffs. And the BW zine, looking at the black and white explosion, self-publishing, and small press books of the 1980s. These are all available right now on my website, jimrug.com. Coming up in November, I will have a new volume of Street Angel. Street Angel Princess of Poverty will be out from Image Comics at the end of November. You can pre-order or reserve that one now. It is a companion piece to Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive, also available from Image Comics. Together, these two books will collect all of my Street Angel comics that I have created so far and finally, Hulk Grand Design, my contribution to the Grand Design stories, one of the books I'm most proud of making. This thing is out of print at the distro level, which means if it's at your comic shop, scoop it up because it is going to disappear and be hard to replace. Prices are already going up online for these, so if you haven't added Hulk Grand Design to your collection yet, do that now. The Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus is out there in full effect. Thank you guys so much for supporting it if you did. And if you have not yet, uh, right at this moment at least, uh, there's there's some steep discounts online that you could find if you don't have a good comic shop in town. 504 pages with about 140 plus pages of additional material. Uh, it's going to serve all customers. The, the people who uh, read Hip Hop Family Tree in the past, you're getting a lot more material to, uh, to chew on. And if you've never seen Hip Hop Family Tree before, like now is the time. We're generating new readership with this uh, latest Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus. Let's sell it out before uh, 2023 closes out the calendar year. I think that's a noble goal, and, and we're uh, more than 75% of the way toward that goal. Not the only holiday piece I'm having uh, come out in 2023. There's going to be an X-Men Grand Design Trilogy trade paperback uh, coming to you. It's going to include all of my X-Men Grand Design works uh, in one handy uh, package. It's going to be the size of a comic. It's going to be smaller than the Hip Hop Family Tree Size Big Books, but uh, that is coming to you in November. Red Room has been the focus for the past couple of years. There are two trade paperbacks out right now, uh, the Anti-Social Network and Trigger Warnings. Third's going to come to you in January. It's called Crypto Killers. And uh, right now I am serializing my daily strip uh, exclusively to my Patreon. Uh, it's, gonna, it's called Switchblade Shorties. It's going to be coming out January 1st, 2024. But you could uh, get a leg up and, and uh, check out those comics before they see the light of day to Gen Pop. Plus, I uh, do streams every now and then here on the kayfabe channel producing new uh new comic pages and new new strips for that series so thank you guys who have been uh, supporting that let's keep that rocking uh the books are the absolute most important part of uh keeping cartoonist kayfabe sustainable uh to the point where jimmy and i could uh, collaborate and put these videos together uh, there are, however, some other ways to support uh, the channel. Jimmy, let the people know. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, stickers, and more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. All good ways to support the channel. Give them some marching orders, Jimmy, and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.